have half an hour. So let's go. So I'm going to talk about modeling and forecasting uh, COVID-19. Uh, um, oops, start off with some acknowledgements. Um, most of the work I do is, is actually uh, uh, me riding on the coattails of a, a very brilliant epidemiologist named Ashley Chu. Um, we are uh, using a lot of excellent work done by grad students at U of T, you know, Jean-Paul Soucy and Isha Berry. We collaborate closely with Amy Greer at the University of, of Guelph. I want to acknowledge my friends in Korea, Asaf Young-Chan and Paul Choi. And more recently, we've been collaborating across uh, the ocean with a mathematician named Steve de Kenning, who runs a company called Matrix Factory in Belgium and can make computers do amazing things. Um, so in terms of COVID, um, I don't think there are any surprises or revelations on this, this graph. Um, uh, this, is, this is where we're at. We have a, a global pandemic that probably began in October, November, of, uh, of 2019 uh, was recognized in uh, late December of, of 2020. And uh, case counts in blue have, have uh, grown initially exponentially and now we're growing linearly and we're up to about four and a half million recognized cases globally with case fatality that hovers uh, uh, somewhere around six to 7% at this point. The fact that case fatality is dropping off a little bit more recently is not a good sign. It suggests that growth of the epidemic is starting to pick up again. And that translates into nearly 300,000 deaths globally. So we use models to try to understand uh, infectious disease epidemics. Uh, models are just simplified versions of complex reality. Um, mathematical models are one kind of models, but there are lots of other sorts of models. And they're useful for gaining insight into the behavior of complex real world uh, systems. Uh, my favorite uh, um, lead in for modeling talks comes from my late colleague, Dr. Babak Purbalal, uh, who was at the BC CDC and was a physicist who got into infectious disease modeling. And uh, he, he pointed out that uh, if you lived in the 11th century, uh, you had no model to explain why if you went up to the top of your castle and dropped a, uh, dropped a rock off the tower, why it would go down, not up. Um, right? That's a, it's a mystery. No one understands that. A few hundred years later, uh, an Englishman named I Isaac Newton is, is sitting under an apple tree and an apple falls down on his head and gives him a bonk. And he formulates a model. He says, I'm going to make a model for something I can't see, smell, touch, or taste called gravity. Uh, gravity is a force that pulls things down. And, and gravity is defined by a very simple model, which is force equals mass times acceleration, a simplified version of reality. And he could then go and do experiments that, that tried to validate his model. And you could see that heavier objects hit the ground harder. Well, that seems to work well. Mass times acceleration uh, translates into the force with which they hit the ground. But then he might be confounded by exceptions to the rule. So he might see that helium balloons, even though they have a mass, go up, not down. And that would tell him that he needs to go back and refine his model. So, so modeling is an iterative process where we start really simple and we layer on complexity until ultimately we get more and more insights into complex systems. Um, and I think in epidemiology for communicable disease that data and models are the yin and yang, where we use models to synthesize the data we have and to also identify important areas of uncertainty. If we don't know uh, a particular parameter well, does it matter that we don't know it well? If we, if we dial that parameter up and down over plausible ranges, do our, our conclusions change? That's something called sensitivity analysis. So we can use our model to go out and prioritize data that we need to gather. We test our model predictions. Uh, we can extend our theoretical frameworks, reparameterize our model, and back we go, see how our model works. And so, so we, we have this sort of iterative process that can go on for, in the case of physics, go on for a few hundred years, start with the observation that an apple falls down out of a tree and not up, and ultimately by the 1960s have Newtonian, Newtonian physics so, so sophisticated that you're able to fire a rocket ship from Florida and have people get out of the rocket on the moon using Newtonian physics. That's all just refinement of that model. 
Um, and as Babak used to say, models lead us from data to actual understanding. And when we understand processes, we can predict and control them. And that, of course, is the name of the game with pandemics that are uh, causing disease and, and death. Uh, Ashley's uh, line, which I love, is that we are all modelers, but not all, all, all modelers use maths. We're all making models and heuristics all the time in our daily lives. Um, we're all using mental shortcuts in order to get us to our goals. We happen to use math for our models, but not all models use math. So what does math have to do with infectious diseases? Well, infectious diseases are diseases caused by, by microbes, bacteria, fungi, viruses, or their products. So um, some infectious diseases like tetanus are caused by little proteins that are elaborated by bacteria, but not by the bacteria themselves. Um, communicable diseases are a subset of infectious diseases, and their fundamental property is transmission. Communicable diseases spread from creature to creature. Uh, if they're diseases of humans, they spread from human to human. Uh, if they're communicable diseases of other critters, they spread from critter to critter. Um, and communicable diseases are a little bit different from a lot of other diseases we study uh, because a case is also a risk factor. So uh, current cases produce future cases. That means cases aren't independent of each other. And when current cases produce on average more than one new case, it's the idea of a reproduction number. We can have an exponential increase in case numbers over time, and the other word for that is an epidemic. Um, these aren't new. This uh, uh, dashing chap in the wig is, is Daniel Bernoulli, who's an 18th century mathematician who used math to um, uh, describe the dynamics of smallpox in the city of Paris. He was asked to do that by the city of Paris. So mathematical models have been around for a long time, and they haven't actually changed too, too much, certainly over the last hundred years. We use a lot of the, uh, the model forms that were come up with in the 1920s. Um, models are models. They're not real. They have limitations. Uh, one limitation is that they can oversimplify, although often oversimplification is a strength because you can wrap your mind around a simplified version of a problem when uh, uh, the, the real world version is too complicated. Models are wrong. That's sometimes a strength, too, because a wrong model can um, point out to us that we don't understand a system as well as we think we understand it. Sometimes they're wrong by design, as in the case of COVID-19, when we make projections about what will happen if we don't uh, institute prompt uh, physical distancing uh, in the face of, of exponential growth of cases that we are going to wind up like Bergamo, Italy, or like New York City with our ICUs over, overflowing. So sometimes we want the models to be wrong because the models motivate our leaders to action. Because models use numbers, sometimes they can create a veneer of precision when we don't really have precision. Uh, and this is particularly true when, when we have quantitative predictions from models. Often they're more useful, viewed use, more usefully as qualitative tools. Um, models can prop up wrong-headed policy if they are uncritically applied. And I think we see that in the United States kingdom in Sweden right now in terms of some of the um, initial looks good on paper kind of ideas around uh, generating herd immunity. Um, and again, I think I've already said that. We, if we want to interpret them quantitatively, we need good data, good input data. We need to calibrate the models so they reproduce reality. And we need to be sure that they're valid. That is, if we run the model forward over time, does the course of events actually match up with the model if we want to interpret them quantitatively? This old, this old saw, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, and I think this is right. This is another Babak line that really they're best, best, best used as tools for communication of uncertainty rather than crystal balls that predict the future. This is a brief uh, a glossary of models, uh, of models and modeling, some, some of the terms you might, you might run into. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about phenomenological models, which, which are really just simple, you know, one or two equation models that try to do what epidemics look like without seeking to reproduce their mechanistic underpinnings. Uh, we make a compartmental models, which models and almost describe disease as a flow of infections between compartments. Um, 
some folks, uh, not, not us, not myself at this point, use uh, agent-based models, which are almost like uh, uh, SimCity kind of models, where we model things at the level of individuals rather than uh, populations or compartments. Uh, network models are, are a useful emerging tool that capture some important components of, of infectious diseases. And then these are the, the, the here are two, two important uh, pieces of vocabulary, stochastic and, and determinant. We get a different result every single time. Models that are deterministic, we run over and over again and get exactly the same result. So when, when you're interested in kind of random chance events, uh, for example, extinctions of disease in small populations, we usually want to model that with a stochastic model often with a network model or, or an agent-based model. When in fact in large populations, which come out to generally the same thing, then we tend to use deterministic models. None of these, none of these ideas are mutually exclusive, and models often contain a mix of these, these features and, and, uh, and attributes. So, um, I'll start off by talking about phenomenological models. Um, we use these quite a lot. They simply describe how epidemics grow. This is, a, this is a, an app that we have up on the internet that looks at what's happening to COVID cases, the blue curve over time, and how that would compare to unfettered epidemic growth processes with different reproduction numbers. This red curve has a reproduction number that's constant at 2.3. The orange is a reproduction number that's constant at, at 1.5. And if I had updated this, which I ought to just over this orange curve, suggesting that you know, initial growth was with a reproduction number greater than 1.5, and now it's less than 1.5. Um, in the absence of intervention or immunity, we can use some really simple math to describe how epidemics grow. Uh, the basic reproduction number, R0, is the number of new cases created by an old case of a communicable disease in a totally susceptible population in the absence of intervention. Um, so if we have a, a disease that has, um, has a reproduction number, a basic reproduction number of three, what we expect is we start with one case, that case makes three cases, those make, nine, those make nine in total, those nine cases make 27, those 27 make 81, those 81 make 243, and so forth. So what we can see is for each generation of the epidemic, the number of new cases, this i at t, is just r naught to the t. Three to the zero is one, three to the one is three, three squared is nine, three cubed is, is 27, uh, three to the four is 81. But it doesn't go on indefinitely like that, as you can see here, um, growth slows. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I came up with a, with a model that we use now uh, called the IDEA model, which stands for Incidence, Decay, and Exponential Adjustment. And it looks a lot like this first equation, IT equals R naught to the T, except we've got a denominator which started life as a discount factor, now is a discount factor raised times squared. And it turns out that this, this model works pretty well for forecasting epidemics. We so fancied it up a little. The IDEA model represents infectious disease processes as having exponential growth on the top, that's R naught to the T, and K on the bottom. Uh, so the reason epidemics then peak and end is because that control parameter in the bottom ultimately out, outruns the, the growth parameter in the top. Uh, a couple of years ago, the IDEA model actually is a restatement of something from the 19th century called Farr's Law, but it's also equivalent to SIR models, compartmental models, so we'll talk a bit more about it in a moment. Um, in the presence of accelerating control. So it's sort of like the missing link between FARS law and SIR models. Um, and it works pretty well. The system is going to be controlled in China. Uh, you can see the, uh, using uh, the grout and uh, predicting that things were going to sort of peak and start to go down. And you can see that using uh, uh, 
using uh, uh, data to early February, you're able to say, well, in, in China, this is going to end uh, by March, which turned out to be the case. But of course, the problem was that many other countries had been seeded by then. Um, we can use these simple phenomenological models to describe epidemics and to, and to sort of estimate the good that public health has done. This is some work we did with colleagues in Korea, estimating that uh, you know, if they'd continue, sorry, their, their, uh, oops, Daisy, their epidemic process as it started out in Daegu in, in February, uh, they would be up around 3.4 3 million infections. And they intervened very promptly and they don't have those 3.4 million infections. We can use these models for a uh, kind of a Canada dashboard. And we do this every morning for some partners in uh, provincial and federal public health, uh, where we can make simple idea forecasts. We can plot this control parameter D over time. And we can also estimate uh, the effective reproduction number over time, which is now I'm happy to say uh, a little bit below one in Ontario and uh, a little bit more than a little bit below one in Canada as a whole. It's about 0.8 in Canada as a whole. So those are just some simple examples of simple phenomenological models to describe the mechanisms for spreads. We're simply describing, you know, epidemic is a process that increases exponentially, peaks when the reproduction number hits one, uh, effective no reproduction number hits one, and then goes down the other side. Um, we can get more mechanistic. This is uh, from a figure that uh, in a paper by Ashley Chute that was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal uh, last month, where we can really try to use the model to describe the flow of disease in a population where we start out with people who are susceptible. They're exposed to disease, infected, but not yet infectious. They can become infectious, pre-symptomatic, symptomatic. Folks can be hospitalized, they can be isolated, we can do things to them, uh, they, can, they can die, of course. Um, and we can run models like that out to, to help inform public health policy. And um, Ashley had this very clever idea um, that uh, if you have what she called dynamic social distancing, which is what we are probably going to be doing in effect in Ontario and a lot of other places, here's our Here's our absolute threshold in terms of ICU capacity. This orange curve represents what we would have expected with just attempting to do uh, you know, contact tracing without social distancing. And what Ashley was able to show as well, if you distancing is very potent, but you can probably turn it on and off. We'll have predictably surges and then declines in incidence of disease over time, but it'll keep our ICUs from overflowing. And that's what we've done in Ontario. And uh, other folks have. Uh, um, have come up with similar ideas. So this is a paper by Kissler et al. Group working with Mark Lipsitch. It's actually not in CMAJ, it's in science. That's a typo. But they came up with a very similar idea, this idea of dynamic distancing. We can use that same model. Ashley's now been able to calibrate that model to um, cumulative deaths in a hospital. This excludes nursing homes as well as ICU occupancy in Ontario the model can be calibrated quite nicely. And then we can turn off social distancing and see what our destiny would have been without distancing in Ontario, for example. And you can see we, uh, there's no reason to think we would not have gone the route of uh, Bergamo or New York or, um, or London in terms of filling up our ICUs and having, having kind of mass casualty events, which uh, we've had. They've been in long-term care, not in our hospitals. Um, Ashley can also uh, uh, show us what we can expect. Here's the, the white here represents social distancing. We're going to turn social distancing off, um, which is the gray. And we can expect that uh, the different degrees to which we uh, relax social distancing will predict how much resurgence we see in the days to come. So uh, I think um, uh, the, this dark maroon curve says we're, we're, we're up here in 39 days. Uh, by, by going back to, to normal levels of interaction. I believe this is 30% this is, um, uh, reduction in interaction. We're, we're up here by 44 days, 50% um, uh, uh, reduction in interaction. And this is maintaining social distancing uh, over time. So we can use models to sort of uh, look around the corner and see what we're likely to, uh, to encounter as we relax social distancing. 
Um, some more ex excellent work by Ashley looking at um, parameters around contact tracing, which has obviously created a lot of interest. Uh, you can see here that she's been able to um, uh, vary a bunch of parameters in, in tandem and see that a really important driver of the efficiency of contact tracing in terms of keeping the epidemic from resurging, blue is good, the reproduction number here is staying below one, uh, is really driven by and large by being able to test enough that we can find symptomatic cases in order to have contact tracing be meaningful. Right? If, if, we, if we have very efficient, timely contact tracing, but we're only finding 10% of cases, that doesn't do anything to the effective reproduction number. Um, over here, you have uh, uh, the probability that, uh, uh, that the contacts are notified timely way, and that does make somewhat of a difference. Low notification of contacts to fast notification of contact see here is an effect of, um, of, uh, of very widespread testing. Also what we see over here is these are different degrees of social distancing maintained. Contact tracing becomes a more meaningful exercise when we maintain some degree of social distancing because if we don't maintain social distancing there's simply too many cases for us to do contact tracing in a meaningful way. This is some work of mine uh, as I, uh, Ashley does most of the stuff but I do a little bit of the stuff um, looking at masks as a bi-directional intervention to keep reproduction numbers down and allow us to reopen society to, uh, um, to a degree uh, in order to reopen our economies. Um, and, and what we can see here is the, even if we assume that masks are pretty good, um, if, if we start with a baseline high reproduction number, uh, we, we need a lot of mask uptake. This is 90% uptake and masks working on both transmission and acquisition for us to knock our reproduction number way down. Whereas if we start where we're starting now with a low reproduction number in Ontario, we can have masks only have an impact on transmission. They don't protect you at all. They protect other people from you. And here, even uh, moderately effective masks can uh, drive that reproduction number down well below one so that we can have more economic activity safely. Uh, so models can be a tool to help us uh, uh, think our way through uh, the coming months uh, and avoid, uh, avoid resurgences. So in conclusion, models are just simplified versions of reality that provide insights into the behavior of complex systems. And in the context of COVID, they let us see around corners, especially with lags, you know, if we react to the fact that our ICU is filling up today and use that information to decide to um, uh, institute social distancing, we've, we've missed the boat because there are going to be a couple of generations worth of cases coming with exponentially increasing numbers um, over, the, over the subsequent weeks. And that's how we get into situations like in Italy and like in New York. They're a great platform for synthesizing data from multiple sources. Um, and they can be useful even if they're wrong. Uh, wrong models are useful models because we react and divert catastrophe. And wrong models can also be useful models because they tell us we don't understand the system yet and we can get insights uh, and, and circle back and collect the data we need to um, understand these systems better and model them better. And with that, I, I think I can take some questions. Um, this is my contact information. If folks wanna, wanna be in touch, fire me an email. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. We went through that pretty quickly, but uh, um, I, hope, I hope that was useful to people. Thank you so much. It, I, I, th I think that was very useful. And in fact, we already got some um, chatter in our chat box. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Guillaume Bork um, asks a question that I think you answered a little bit. To do better modeling of COVID in Canada, wouldn't we need more results from random testing in the population? Um, I, th I think what we probably need is, uh, I think what we probably need are seroprevalence studies. Mm -hmm. So most of us, I think at this point, would agree that we miss more COVID than we find. And that's important to incorporate into models for a couple of reasons. From a dynamic model modeling point of view, the major reason to incorporate that is because that lets you know where you are on the epidemic curve. And right now, we, we really don't have any idea. I mean, if we have 60, 70,000 cases in Canada, we're, you know, we're 
a country of, of 40 million. Um, so I just doing doing the math quickly. You know, if if we're if we're one and a half percent uh, infected uh, um, based on uh, based on those numbers, but the but the true true percentage infected is sorry that would be zero point one five percent infected based on those numbers, but the true number is twenty times higher, which it may be based on you know what's out there in seroprevalence studies. That means we're further into this than we think we are, and we have more immune folks probably. I mean, we don't know about immunity yet, but we probably have more immune folks than we think we do. Uh, so that's going to be very important information to recalibrate models as we go forward, zero prevalence data. Um, which feeds into the next comments by Dean Carlin. Um, Without data, any projection would have great uncertainty. Um, and he also comments that uh, the false positive rate of antibody tests are higher than the prevalence. Mm. Well, it depends which antibody test you use, and it depends which population you're testing. And I think the antibody stuff's moving pretty quick. Um, so uh, I think this circles back to what I was saying about qualitative insights being pretty important. Uh, and there's this tendency to over over focus on um, on on uh, precise numbers, which, as you say, you can't do if you don't have good data. We had to go into this from a modeling point of view with no data. Because, you know, with Chinese data applied to Ontario, which is a different society, because we haven't had an epidemic yet. But we were able to provide um, qualitative insights, which is if you institute social distancing late, you're pooched. <laughs> you're gonna, your ICUs are going to overflow. We know this is how many ICUs we have. We know this is what this disease looks like based on how it's grown in other places. And we know that if you... Um, uh, shut down society uh, based on the fact that your ICUs are half full, next week your ICUs are going to be, you know, three times overflowing, and the week after that your ICUs are going to be nine times overflowing or whatever it is, and then you're going to start to actually see some impact of the distancing that you put into place. And, you know, what I, what I would say to you is sometimes you don't need a model. Uh, you know, we live next door to this large American state called New York, which went through exactly what the model said we would go through if we didn't distance in the way we did. And kudos to Premier Ford for taking the action he did in a timely way. Yeah, great. Um, Pablo asks, can any of these models uh, be used to estimate true incidences, especially in regions with limited testing and low death reports linked to COVID? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I, you know, I, I don't think, um, if, you, if, if, you don't ha if you don't have the data, um, you know, it's pretty hard to, as I say, have meaningful quantitative uh, um, outputs. I think people do get pretty creative in terms of, of how they estimate burden of disease. What we've learned this past week is that Stats Canada doesn't um, actually have the data in a timely enough way for us in Canada to look at things like excess mortality, which is usually the way you want to do it. Right, many countries around the world are now looking at excess mortality associated with COVID. So that's that's more data driven. I think I think what models let you do is they let you synthesize that data and look ahead down the road at what it implies. They're not a substitute for data. They can tell you where you might want to go look for some more data. Um, but as I say, I'm going to keep coming back to this. Sometimes you don't need a model, and people keep saying, "Well, you know, precisely how much social distancing was there?" It's not like we as a society can say, "Oh, well, we're now at 70 percent." Uh, you know, distanced, and we're going to relax that to 43.8%, and then we'll be fine, right? The, the qualitative insight is the important one, is that when we're more distanced, the disease resurges slower. When we uh, move more back to normal, the disease resurges faster. That's much more important than it. anything I say quantitatively will be wrong. Um. So uh, one last question, and then we got to wrap up our time. Uh, Dominique Fignon, <laughs> asks, can wastewater-based ep epidemiology be useful? In it sure can. <laughs> and Thank how? You. It's, it's absolutely not my field, but um, wastewater epidemiology, the whole freaking tree of life is down the sewer. And PCR at this point lets us understand all kinds of things that go up here on surface world based on DNA that's down in the sewer. Um, the Israelis have been doing this for years to do polio virus surveillance on sewage, um, and, and we're actually able to catch a resurgence early. 
The Danes have done this uh, with a global network to look at antibiotic resistance around the world, just based on uh, resistance determinants, genes that they pull out of sewage. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of groups in uh, Germany and California and the Netherlands now who are showing that um, quantita quantitation of uh, COVID uh, RNA in sewage is a really good index of how much disease activity you have up on the surface. It's a great idea. It's not my not my area, not my field, but I hope someone in Canada is put it. In fact, I know there are a couple of groups working on it. It's a great idea. And um, in fact, uh, Dominique Frignon is the moderator of our um, wastewater channel on our Can COVID Slack. So <laughs> for sure, yeah. that's nice. <laughs> nice yeah. self-serving question there, Mr. Uh, well, you know, as, as the host, I have some amount of control over that. And in fact, we are at our time. I want, we have more questions that we could go on, um, but I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day uh, and giving a wonderful talk. Thank you, everyone, for attending and your great questions, and we will see you on Tuesday. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.